G'day and welcome to what is apparently one of the most overhyped and overrated vehicles that money can buy, the Ford Ranger Raptor. Now, the Ranger Raptor, it does receive, unfortunately, a surprising level of hate, but surely there's no denying that this thing is one hell of a capable and talented vehicle. And according to Ford's marketing department and the fans, if you want the ultimate 4x4 dual cab yet, well, it simply has to be a Ranger Raptor. But do the critics have a point? Because is the Raptor one of the most, let's say, overhyped and overpromoted vehicles in recent history? But as proven by countless tests and reviews, Ford and the fans were right. When brand spanking new and in standard form, these pretty much were the ultimate 4x4 dual cab ute. But that was when these were brand spanking new, and now that there's a brand new Ranger Raptor out, plenty of these are popping up on the used market. So are they still any good? Like what goes wrong with them? What do they cost to own and operate? What do they like to live with on a daily basis? But most importantly, should you buy one? Now with the amount of money that Ford poured into the marketing of this thing, we're pretty sure that you're aware that this is the very pinnacle of the T6 Ford Ranger range, but let's cover off the important stuff first. Available from 2018 to 2021 and from the factory in purely 4x4 dual cab ute or pickup form, the Raptor is loaded with a host of bespoke and specific modifications and equipment when compared to the normal Ranger that it's based on. We're talking tougher looks thanks to the Raptor body kit and the aggressive font sticker pack and a host of off-roading accessories, BF Goodridge all-terrains wrapping 17-inch alloys which are hiding four-wheel disc brakes, plus a wider track and a suspension lift. But under the skin, the differences continue with a chassis engineered to handle some very serious off-road antics, ditching the normal Ranger's rear-end leaf springs for coilovers using a Watts Link setup and a solid rear axle, stiffened side rails, all controlled by arguably class-leading Fox 2.5 shocks. However, the 2.0-litre four-cylinder turbocharged diesel engine and 10-speed automatic gearbox are the very same as those found in later and regular Ranger models, and many do complain that this engine, it simply doesn't have the, the punch or character that you'd expect from a power plant in a Raptor model. That's probably why the new Raptor has actually ditched this engine for a more impressive unit. Now obviously there's a whole bunch of other details that we could go over in this video, but if we did that it would take forever. So instead of doing that in this video, we have gathered all that information and we've put it in our incredibly handy and totally free Redriven cheat sheets that are at redriven.com. And we've also put a link down there in the description. Firstly, even though the suspension in this thing has been set up to you know, tackle off-road tracks and off-road tracks at high speed, and even though this is a few years old and has over 150,000 kilometers on it, the suspension on normal roads is phenomenal. Still feels fantastic. It's supple, yet yeah, controlled, excellent. But like the ride quality has a real like a refinement and quality to it and when you hit like potholes or joins in the road it doesn't jiggle all over the road like many of many other dual cab utes in this class however it, it does still feel like a 4x4 dual cab ute just an incredibly well sorted one like the steering it still feels accurate whereas some of the competition it can they can just feel downright vague and the good thing about the steering is that it, it helps give the impression like this is a pretty big unit of a thing but it does give the impression that it's a smaller vehicle than what it actually is now this is really handy when you're trying to maneuver this thing in a, in a tight spot like on a bush track or more realistically in a shopping center car park or when you're reverse parking now in terms of the sounds in here first of all rattles and squeaks none tiny one there but besides that no rattles and squeaks it's, it honestly feels as tight as a drum there is a bit of a, a dull roar from the all-terrain tires that's to be expected and there's a bit of wind noise when you get up to speed on the freeway but again to be expected rattles noises squeaks pretty good oh the engine sounds like shit that's annoying now that brings me to what is apparently the Raptors Achilles heel this engine Look, it's not, it's not a horrible engine to drive as such, it just does the job, but the problem is when the rest of the vehicle feels as special as this Raptor does, it's just, the engine feels, it's like the, the weak link in a chain. Like the power off the line, it's fine, it's decent enough, but yeah, it, it does like a few horses under the bonnet once you're up to, you know, freeway speeds. Also, a few owners have complained that this 10-speed automatic box, it can feel like it's hunting for gears all the time, or it can be a bit harsh on changes and even a bit a bit slow on reactions. But in this one, I don't know if it's had like maybe a software reflash because it feels good. Like it's not really hunting for gears that much. It is a 10-speed, so it's going to be swapping around all over the place a bit, but... Yeah, it's fine. Now, there are multiple drive modes, and these generally send their power and torque to the rear wheels. However, there is a four-wheel drive high range and low range mode available as well. Plus, the rear diff lock can be activated in many of those modes, which is unlike some other 4x4 dual cab utes on the market. 
Now, something to be aware of, the BF Goodridge all-terrains that are fitted to these as standard can be a bit of a nightmare in the wet, and especially when they've worn down a little bit. So just make sure that whoever has owned the vehicle has fitted quality aftermarket rubber, and just be, just be light with that right foot when you're exiting a roundabout in the wet. Okay, so overall, what's it like to drive? Well, look, if we're basing this review and you know the fact that should you buy one based purely on what the driving experience is like, then yes, you should buy one because driving it, it's exceptional, it's fantastic. But there's a lot more to it than that. Okay, now in terms of the interior, look, obviously this is subjective, but for me at least, Ford have done a fantastic job at enhancing this interior rather than just tarting it up with a whole bunch of accessories. Like the normal Ranger, it still feels you know, pretty tough and rugged in here, but the seats are fantastic. They're super comfortable, kind of like a, like a sport seat, plus the actual materials used are really, really nice. This sort of slight leather treatment up here is really cool. The blue stitching is a really nice highlight, plus the cool Raptor logo on the seat here and also on the bottom of the steering wheel. And everything, like where you touch, like your armrests and everything you hold, just feels quality. Now in terms of wear and tear, this car has over 150,000 kilometers on it and it's one of the early editions. Wear and tear wise, really good. Like the bolsters on the seats, on the right here, it's a little bit overly squishy, but it's not too bad. The leather is getting just a touch shiny, but it's again, not, not terrible. Even the, the, the Alcantara is wearing quite nicely. Leather on the steering wheel, that could, yeah, that could do with a bit of a refresh. But besides that, like there's not a lot of scratches, even like the, the painted surfaces, which are generally guilty for getting rubbed off or scratched really easily on this, like they're all wearing really good, really well. Now, in terms of practicality, heaps. First of all, door bins, massive. There's a perfect spot down here for your phone. Actually, probably a, there's probably a spot down there for like a couple of phones in case you're a Raptor owner and you need a burner phone for some reason. Don't know why that would be. Um, got two cup holders here. Now, in other lesser ranges, they actually have three cup holders. There's a small cup holder for small pretentious coffees. I feel like Ford seemed to assume that those buying Raptors aren't pretentious wankers like me drinking pretentious wanker coffees like espressos or piccolos or, you know, ristrettos. So yeah, only two cup holders, a bit disappointing. And a massive bin here, bloody good size glove box, spot for sunglasses up here, and that's about it, nothing under the seats. That's, uh, that's, that's fuses. Yeah, really good practicality up front. Now in the back seat, I'm about 138 centimeters taller than the average Velociraptor. It turns out that they're way smaller than what Jurassic Park led us to believe. This is in my driving position, and you know what? Pretty bloody good, like good amount of foot room, and knees aren't scrubbing up against the back of the seat too much. It's pretty comfortable, it's even more comfortable if you put the, the headrest up like that. Yeah, it's good, nice back here. As far as wear and tear goes, Excellent. Like, I don't think this thing's uh, been used too much in the back because the leather still feels excellent. The Alcantara, Alcantara or suede effect feels really, really nice. Door cards aren't scratched up too much. There's a couple little scratches here, but nothing too major. Yeah, wear and tear in this particular Raptor, excellent. Now, practicality in the back seat, pretty good. You've got map pocket or, you know, redriven script pocket holders behind the seat. You've got power outlets here. You've got a pull down armrest with a couple of cup trays here, and you've got excellent sized door bins that are easy to access even when the doors are shut and someone's sitting there. There's also more practicality under the back seat, and I'll show you that in a second. So flip this up, and you have a spot specifically designed for stuff, and another spot specifically designed for more stuff here. How good's that? Now, practicality in the rear tray, thanks to the Raptor's very sexy suspension setup, this thing actually has a lower payload capacity and a lower towing capacity than the normal Ranger. Plus, in the tub, you get multiple tie-down points and a power outlet, while in the actual tray itself, you get eight olive holders, four Jats cracker holders, two Jalsberg cheese holders, and 29 Cabanossi holders. Now, in terms of tech and features, being the very top of the range Ranger and also asking some pretty serious money, you would expect this thing to be pretty much drenched in equipment. And it is. First of all, Ford's SYNC 3 infotainment system is excellent. It's easy and intuitive to use, and it features Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, and all of the connectivity you'd ever want. Operated via an 8-inch touchscreen, the steering wheel mounted buttons, or voice recognition for some commands. The sound system itself sounds... Pretty good, it's not amazing, but it does the job. Behind that leather wrapped steering wheel sit magnesium paddle shifters, while elsewhere inside you'll find keyless entry and start, a couple of USB and 12 volt ports, leather and suede style upholstery, and heated seats. For even more features and extras, there's the Raptor X model. However, the differences over the normal Raptor are pretty minimal. Short of some extra graphics, black alloy wheels, a sports bar, front tow hooks, and some smaller aesthetic additions, it's pretty much business as usual. 
Now, in terms of safety, let's get the negatives out of the road first. There's no adaptive cruise control, there's no front parking sensors, and there's no blind spot monitoring, which is pretty disappointing for a vehicle asking this much money. However, when the Ranger that this is based on was tested by ANCAP back in 2015, it did receive a perfect five-star score. But to take you through what safety features it does have, we're gonna have my mate just simply rock out telling you what safety features it's got. Again, for the full breakdown of all the tech, the features and the safety gear, simply jump on redriven.com and check out that cheat sheet. Now, before we get into what goes wrong with these, we've got to give a massive shout out to the Raptor owners groups that we spoke to and actually anyone that we spoke to in helping research this video. You guys are legends. We couldn't have done this without you. Actually, speaking of owners groups, if you own one of these or you're thinking about buying one of these, join an owners group. Honestly, the amount of stuff that you'll learn from these guys is incredible. You guys are legends. Okay, so what goes wrong with these things? Well, look, in terms of the exterior, it's actually pretty good news. We, through our research, we couldn't really find any common issues as such that are at least the Raptor's fault. Actually, through our research, we found that there are plenty of owners out there that, you know, treat these things like utter crap and they never wash them, never look after the exterior, and they're blown away at just how robust the exteriors are. However, the issues that we did find were generally due to mainly driving like a dickhead and abusing it mainly off-road or just aftermarket equipment not being fitted correctly, and hence why it's absolutely critical to watch our Ultimate 4x4 Buyer's Guide video, and the link for that is just up there somewhere. In that video, we elaborate way more on a whole bunch of factors of obviously not just the Raptor, but you know, any 4x4, and please watch it before you buy any 4x4 because it, honestly, it could just save you thousands. Now, as far as problems and common issues inside, it's pretty much a similar story as outside, not a whole lot goes wrong. There are the odd sporadic reports of things like this happening, like a squeaky armrest and you know occasional buttons or electronic gremlins here and there. But again, guys, I'm not common issues. They're very sporadic reports. However, if you are in the market for one of these things and it has any aftermarket equipment bolted to it and any buttons inside, please press those buttons and make sure those buttons do something. They've got to actually work. You'd be amazed at how many people buy 4x4s drenched in accessories and they don't test that everything works and then they buy it and it doesn't work and then they get ripped off. Now, before we get into mechanically what can go wrong with the Raptor, look, the only way that we can keep Redriven going is with your support. And the best way of supporting us is simply by hitting those like, subscribe, and bell buttons and sharing our content. If you do all of that, we can keep making these videos for you. And hopefully that's a good thing. Okay, now mechanically, what goes wrong with the Raptor? Look, I'd love to tell you, but I can't because I'm not a qualified mechanic. But you know who is? Jim. There's a distinct divide here. There are the owners that have them and have never had a problem and they love them. And then there's the owners that have had heaps of problems and absolutely hate them. Typically, in our research, we found that for every four people that have had a really good experience, there's just one person that's had a terrible experience. And for the people that have had the problems, there are reports of multiple water pump failures, fuel pump issues, EGR complications, turbo problems, oil leaks, wiring issues and catastrophic engine failures, and the list can go on. But remember, there are those that have had zero problems whatsoever. The engines in these, um, they make good power and they're nice and quiet and smooth. The two litre twin turbo diesel in these, they're a pretty good engine. They have a timing belt, not a timing chain, but the timing belt actually runs in oil. They call it a bio belt. Uh, which stands for belt in oil. Now, traditionally, oil has been the arch nemesis of timing belts since, well, since forever. But Ford claim they don't need any maintenance and they're good for at least 250,000 Ks. Right, well, we'll just see about that, see how that pans out in 10 years, shall we? The 10-speed auto in these has had its fair share of problems right from the start, with some problems being rectified with just a software update and in other cases, catastrophic transmission failure. Interestingly, the transmissions on these have a service interval of 240,000 Ks or 10 years. 
Now, even though they do have a really clever oil filtration system, look, if you want it to last, you really should be servicing it at least every 100,000 Ks. And the same goes for the diffs and the whole drive line. Every 100,000 Ks, change the oil. So with owners' experiences varying so much and so many seemingly unrelated sporadic reliability issues, it's hard to predict the long-term reliability of these things. Like everything in this category, you need to be looking at ones that have a impeccable service history and preferably low mileage and be bloody careful of any of these that have been modified and modified poorly and have a good look at them and get a pre-purchase inspection to see if they've been abused. So if it all checks out and you really must have one, well, Adam, what can we expect to pay? Okay, now the depressing part of the video. Currently here in Australia, Ranger Raptors are asking anywhere from just under $60,000 all the way to just over $100,000. A hundred grand for a dual cab ute is it's, like, it's a hell of a dual cab ute, don't get me wrong, but is that asking too much? Let us know in the comments, let us know what you think. Anyway, look, something like this, a 2018 model, but with over 150,000 Ks on it, but in superb condition, you're gonna look anywhere between 65 and 70 grand. But what do they cost to own and operate? Ford claim a fuel consumption figure of 8.2 litres per 100 Ks, but through our research, we found that many owners are seeing figures pretty regularly over 10. In fact, this particular Raptor, it's seeing 18.6 litres per 100 Ks. In its defence, the majority of this thing's life is spent in built up Sydney traffic all the time. And when it's not in traffic, it's literally out in the wilderness exploring sand dunes and you know, gravel tracks and stuff like that. And, and the owner, like the best of us, has a heavy right foot. Now, just backtracking to what goes wrong with these, the good news is even the earliest editions of these are still covered under Ford's factory warranty. So look, unless you've been driving it like a complete dickhead, Ford should uh, hopefully cover anything that goes wrong. Okay, but after all of that, should you buy one? Overall, and for the majority of you, look, if you've got the financial means to justify the current asking prices and maintain it accordingly, and you found the perfect Ranger Raptor, it's a yes. These are still awesome. They're not perfect, but still, what an awesome thing. But remember, as Jim alluded to, buying even a really good Raptor can still be a bit of a gamble. However, for a few of you watching this, it's actually a no. No, you should not buy a Ranger Raptor. Remember how I mentioned that the Raptor receives a concerning level of hate? Well, to be more specific, it's not so much the Raptor that cops the vitriol, but more accurately, it's some of its owners. Let's be honest here, a lot of people buying these things are buying them purely for the tough and rugged image that they portray. And if you're buying a big off-road focused dual cab ute, just like a Raptor, purely as an image statement, and you have little to no intention to ever go off-road in it, that's just pretty bloody sad. Not only are the Raptor's immense talents going to waste, but it does raise some pretty serious questions about your priorities in life and your levels of self-esteem. Look, I'm really sorry, but look, as tempting as the Raptor may be, dropping nearly $100,000 on a tough and rugged 4x4 dual cab ute is not gonna fill that enormous gap in your personality. But still, awesome thing. Okay, so we wanna know, would you buy one? Do you already own one? If you're not gonna buy one of these, what else would you buy instead? Let us know in those comments and we'll see you next week. See ya.